very different today when I think back at what we did then. I'm still very proud of what we did, but um, certainly not as informed as, you know, what I have now as a, a layering of experiences and things like that. But it all takes time to learn. This is not a do one class and you know how to do everything kind of thing. This is an experience that you learn over the years. And I'm still learning, even after 19 years of being in this business. Welcome to She Invests. Join us every week for conversations focused on the growing number of female angel investors, the real unicorns. You'll hear from existing female angel investors, VCs, and fund managers on their investment thesis. From deal flow to exits, they will share the best practices that contribute to their success. Female angel investors will be equipped with the tools and resources to confidently activate their capital in order to make an impact in their community and the global economy. With your host, active angel investor and founder of Hera Angels, Dr. Sylvia Ma. We have Susan Preston on the She Invest podcast. It is such a pleasure to have her. Susan is general partner of the California Clean Energy Fund. She is also the Burke Endowed Fellow for Entrepreneurship at the University of Washington, a trustee for the Angel Resource Institute, chair of ARI Women First Enterprises, managing member of the Seattle Angel Fund, and on various for-profit and not-for-profit boards. In her illustrious career, Susan was a partner in three law firms and was an entrepreneur in residence with the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation for six years and continues as a consultant, specifically focusing on initiatives related to angel investing through the ARI. Susan is also the author of Angel Financing for Entrepreneurs, Early Stage Funding for Long-Term Success, and Angel Investment Groups, Networks, and Funds, a guidebook to developing the right angel organization for your community, published by the Kauffman Foundation. She has been and continues to be a national and international speaker on economic development, angel investing, and venture financing. Susan was on the cover of Red Herring and has been profiled in Inc. Magazine and other national publications and has contributed to numerous nationally published articles. She is a founder and immediate past president of Seraph Capital Forum, the first all-women's accredited investor angel investment organization, and is the architect of two federal bills, H.R. 5198 and S. 3950, a federal income tax credit for private equity financing. Susan is a pioneer in the angel field, having been an angel investor since 1999. Everything she does revolves around angel investing, from teaching to managing to learning. We are thrilled and honored to have you on the show. Welcome. Well, Susan, welcome to the She Invest podcast. We're so excited to have you part of our group of wonderful ladies that are investing in this ecosystem. Thank you very much. I am very happy to be here. Yes. I always ask uh, a lot of the ladies who come on the show is that, how did you get involved? What was that first investment like? Uh, Because some of us were really excited, but kind of scared. And walk us through a little bit about that first investment that you did. So I got into angel investing probably a little bit differently than some people. Um, Let me take just a couple of minutes and tell the story because I think it's kind of interesting. Wonderful. Um, So in 1999, that's how long ago that I started angel investing. There was, I was a corporate securities lawyer partner in a high tech law firm. So in 1999, if um, some people are old enough, will remember that that was the dot com boom times. I was seeing a ton of private placements and IPOs and things like that. And being a corporate securities lawyer um, was working on a lot of those things. And every time I looked at the cap table, it was nothing but men that were named on it. And it kind of, I went, geez, this just doesn't seem right. I know a lot of really smart women out there that are completely capable of making investments, financially capable, um, intellectually, all that good stuff. So started talking to some of the women I knew in the city of Seattle um, and asking them about it and seeing if it kind of irritated them as well. They said, yes. And so we formed a small subgroup um, to put together the first meeting and the idea of what we were going to do. And I sent out 225 invitations to the first meeting and 175 women showed up. Pent up need and desire um, and interest And that was, thus was born, the very first all-women's angel group in the United States uh, called Seraph Capital Forum. So that's how I got involved in angel investing. 
That's amazing. Um, it, that first group I've noticed in these interviews is that that really solidifies like, okay, there is a need. I really need these ladies around me and you guys do amazing mm-hmm. work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it was really neat that way. Yeah. I love it when, and when everybody shows up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was the phenomenal part is having that many, that percentage of people that were invited to actually show up. That was an amazing feat. So I was very happy about that. And that first year, what did you guys do? I mean, you know, it's it's really neat. You have that momentum. You're saying, wow, we really want to make a difference. You know, that, that first year must have been pretty amazing. Well, it was. There were We had well over 100 members that first year. And um, we did a lot of investing that first year. Uh, a lot of us invested. And in, I had a company come in and pitch to the group just as an example of a company that, you know, that would be a eligible and interesting for us to invest in. And I think that company got seven people to invest in it, including myself. So it was really neat that way. Um, I had a lot of fun with it. And it sort of struggled um, through the recession and so forth. Um, So, but those first heady years were wonderful. Were absolutely wonderful uh, in doing that. And it really, we did a lot of education, uh, which is always important, just as you're doing discussing and supporting one another and working together. It was uh, just a remarkable experience. I loved it. You kind of preempted my next question was education. (laughs) (laughs) How did you know that? Um, So um, yeah, the ladies that came in, were they, um, were they already existing angels? Cause that's something that when when both of us are trying to increase the number of female angel Mm -hmm. investors, those ladies come in, how did they, they know about it? Um, And what were the key learnings that they had to get through before they made that first check? I think a lot of the women were willing to take um, a fairly significant plunge without too much background. There were a select group of us that this is the right thing to do. We want to do it. We want to, and a lot of times it was women entrepreneurs, of course, that we were supporting because they were attracted to our group with all women, which was wonderful. That was part of it. But the other part was is that we just started having training sessions um, like on Saturday mornings, um, once a month and things like that. We would pick um, different topics to have, meet for half a day on Saturday mornings. Uh, and we usually had a pretty significant crowd there. And we would ask people that um, amongst our members or individuals that we knew to come in and talk to us about certain topics like how to analyze financials. Being a lawyer, I could talk about terms um, of deals and things like that. So there were lots of things in marketing. We had people with different skill sets that would share their experiences within the group. It's very different today when I think back at what we did then. I'm still very proud of what we did, but um, certainly not as informed as, you know, what I have now as a kind of a, a layering of experiences and things like that. But it all takes time to learn. This is not a do it, do one class and you know how to do everything kind of thing. This is this is a, an experience that you learn over the years, and I'm still learning, um, even after 19 years of being in this business. I, I echo that that sentiment as well. I'm always learning. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the more that we learn, the more informed is, uh, we are. Um, and then, like, now you're still in education, and you're and um, the Angel Resource Institute is just amazing. The HALO Report, all of those things are are, are informing angel investors to make or NVCs to make better decisions. Education is important to you, obviously. Um, mm-hmm. How did you kind of walk through that and grow that, that aspect of your career? Not long after I started Sarah Capital Forum, that actually got the attention of Kauffman Foundation. And so I started working at Kauffman Foundation uh, first in the, in the area and running all the women entrepreneurship programs and grants that we did. I did that for a few years. And then I switched over to the angel um, initiatives that we had that had been started at Kaufman. And I was actually one of the founders of the Angel Capital Association, the Angel Resource Institute. Uh, so I uh, was there at the very first meeting back in Boston in 2003 or four, 2000, something like that. Now I can't even remember. <laughs> it's okay. um, uh, very first meeting. Obviously, you know, just excitement all around in the idea of getting angels together and educating and training and creating a a membership organization around it and so forth. So that was what, um, and then I was the principal individual at Kaufman that worked with lawyers to create the 501c3 and 501c6 that are now ARI and ACA, 
So I was there from the very beginning for both of those organizations. And that's really how I got involved with um, the organizations was being there at Kauffman Foundation um, when it was just an idea. And we were doing programs, education training programs through Kauffman uh, before we actually launched. And we were doing some level of research as well, understanding the um, imperative and the brilliant, the importance the angels play in development of early stage companies. It really is quite vital. Let's go through that because um, I think that's so important. Early stage investors coming in early, um, mm-hmm. really having that that conversation with that entrepreneur and you know empowering them and encouraging them, supporting them, not just through mentoring, because we see mm-hmm. a lot of that, um, but really investing in them. Um, mm-hmm. How, I mean, obviously we're, I'm singing to the choir here, is that how important yeah. is that um, in that pipeline of growing the economy across the United States? I mean, we, we invest in tens of thousands of companies every year. Now, we know a lot of those things will not make it, but the statistics, we also know that most new jobs are created in the first year of a company's existence. So we know we're feeding into that employment process. Um, we know that venture capitalists do not come down all the way to where we invest because it just it doesn't make practical sense for them uh, to be deploying small amounts of capital. And doing that. Um, so the companies have to grow somewhere. And there are not a lot of, you know, most companies are not started by self-made billionaires uh, and doing that, that um, have their own capital to grow their own company and doing that. Um, they're postdoc researchers out of universities. There are people with really bright ideas. I mean, look at Facebook. I mean, it was started by a college kid. So there are, an, there was angel investors in that, um, angels investors in Costco. All these great companies started out with, with few exceptions um, by having angels support them. They're the shining examples of what can happen. You know, for every company that succeeds and is, is a Facebook, there are 10,000 companies that have not succeeded at doing that. So that's why diversification of our portfolio um, and making investments um, on a, in a variety of areas is really um, is really important um, for us to be doing and understanding how do we how do we work that. So we always encourage people to have somewhere between ten and twenty companies in their portfolio. Uh, I'm doing that. We also um, I'm a big proponent of people um, spending a lot of time in diligence. Our group up here that I manage, we spend probably about an average of 150 hours collectively doing diligence. There's usually six to seven people on each diligence team. So it, for each individual, it's not a, a you know big burden. But um, it, it goes to the, the point, though, that the more time you put into it, I think the better the outcomes. And we're proving that already. Our first fund, we run annual funds. And the first fund has already given almost 3x money back in two years um, to our investors. Yeah, yeah. We're doing very well from that standpoint. And I think that the time you put into diligence up front, but also the post-investment engagement is very, very critical um, to these companies' success in doing that. Yeah, you mentioned that on GeekWire, one of your um, interviews. Oh, there. yeah. And that, that, uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're like, yes, I'm, say, I'm seeing the same things. Um, that post-investment engagement is so important. Mm-hmm. Um, what does that actually mean? I mean, I know that I mentor my, my um, investment uh, portfolio companies, but really, what, how do you turn the dial as an investor to really help? I know each individual um, entrepreneur is different, but what have you seen that really helps? Well, I think that a lot of times what I'm doing is I'm I'm tapping into my prior experiences as in-house general counsel and COO of public and private companies. So I'm tapping into that um, prior experience of being on the floor running. I've also been on about 40 boards. So I'm that's what I'm really doing is I'm utilizing all those experiences that I have. There's a lot of commonalities between companies, even you know, even diversely in um, different industries that they can be in. So, but I, I tend to focus a little bit on companies that are in the biotech area because of my own background in microbiology and biochemistry. So I have a tendency to gravitate for companies like that because I think that's where I can do, create the greatest value, 
Um, other members of our fund up here are board members in other companies, and um, I support them actively and talking through issues with them um, and seeing how we can resolve. Reaching out into our group uh, for others who may have expertise or connections that would support our companies. Um, that that sort of thing. So it's really been very, um, it, it's been invaluable for the companies and for, for me um, to have that kind of um, connection with all the companies. And of course, having a communication, you know, plan with all of your companies, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know, quarterly reports or something like that. And then maybe mm-hmm. me, um, talking to them on a consistent basis, because you don't know until you're in the weeds um, to, to, to help them. Very true. Oh, that's very true. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, what about if an, uh, a company is not communicating to you? How do you reach out to, to them and say, you know, I really would love to see X, Y, Z? Well, I reach out to them and say, I would really <laughs> like to see X, Y, Z. Um, it, uh, the other thing is that um, set that up up front, the expectation up front. Um, uh, I always ask for a management rights letter so that I have the right to, you know, say on a periodic, you know, not bugging people. But on a periodic basis, say, I'd like to come in and talk to you. I'd like to, you know, look at these things. We'd like, I'd like to go over with it, you with this, that kind of thing. So um, I do set it up so that we have the right to do that. Um, we make fairly um, decent investments. Um, the size of our investments are pretty decent. So a lot of times that does afford us a board seat. Uh, so that's certainly a good place for us to um, have that level of influence that we're looking for uh, in doing that. So that's. Those are a lot of different ways. Uh, and generally, it's helpful with the fact that I've been in this business for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, my legal background does help a lot of times in sort of giving me the um, um, the gravitas uh, to have discussions with them. But also, it really does make a difference when you say you've been investing for nearly 20 years and you've also been a venture capitalist and, you know, you've seen a lot of these things. You've been, so people have a tendency to say, OK, maybe she does know something. <laughs> um, it's like you have to qualify yourself <laughs> in doing it. I, I love all of that. That's so that's so empowerful because, you know, women who are starting off or they've been around for a while investing, they might not have that gravitas like you do and say, hey, you know what, I yeah. really need this or that. So I love having, you know, let's say asking for that board seat, asking for that that communication, right? I mean, I think that depending on the amount you invest you have to be and depending on whether or not the value is there that you add. And that's really important that I stress that I have many of my members on other boards of our our portfolio companies, uh, and they're selected based on their experience doing that and their background. So we are pretty specific about um, people who are selected um, to be on board. So, for instance, one of our companies, the member that was selected, um, identified is a CFO and she's been a CFO for two or three SaaS companies. Well, this is a company that's a SaaS-based model company, um, and they were struggling on from understanding how to properly um, develop financials. So that was a perfect that was a perfect fit in doing that. So that's those are the kind of things that you look for: is that how do we align people really well? Yeah, and that alignment is really important because. Um, in that angel investment world, we have to really be passionate about that that alignment between mm-hmm. the investor and and the entrepreneur. Walk me through that. How do you explain that to an angel investor who's starting off saying it is that? It's just part of the training that I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the logic of it, I guess, becomes pretty evident that you're more valuable to the company um, with your, if your background is relevant and aligned with what they need, to me, that is sort of obvious. If you're a software person, you're probably not going to be as valuable to a medical device company to be to a company that is um, into infra, you know, infrastructure or um, enterprise software or something like that. So I, I think that you know, it becomes pretty self-evident like that. I haven't really had any problem with people feeling that they can be on a board um, just because they, you know, they breathe. Mm. (laughs) Well, I think I've had pretty good success with people not um, feeling that they should be on a board just because they want to be on a board. Exactly. And I think that 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 alignment is really important. That's sort of how um, I usually approach it with people. 
walk me through too about when an entrepreneur is sitting in front of an investor, um, how does that entrepreneur also get that investor's uh, attention? You know, maybe a couple of things that they can do that really um, entices an investor to say, um, at, you know, let's go for a next meeting. I think that a comp- uh, entrepreneur's, you know, three minute pitch, um, they learn, or one minute pitch actually, um, sort of the elevator concept is extremely important. In that first slide, they really need to capture the um, investors, prospective investors' attention. And so they've got to get us leaning forward and wanting to hear more. So they need to give us the high level aspects of the company and um, really entice us to want to hear more because it's a large market or there's a defined pain um, or there's um, they've accomplished some things. They really want to capture us um, in that time frame. But I tell every entrepreneur out there, and the statistics support this, is that you have to be a solution for a problem, um, a pain in the market that the customer recognizes they have a pain. And they also recognize that you are the preferred solution at a reasonable price. So it has to have certain attributes to it. You can't just build a product and expect the market to come to you. Um, you have to have a solution to an existing pain in the market. And it has to be a recognized solution. It cannot be something that the customer has to struggle with understanding and can't put the whole concept together to figure out why this is a solution that they need. So that's, I think those are concepts that are really important. If you look at the statistics out there, the number one reason why companies fail is bad market timing or no market desire, no market need. And the biggest reason why companies succeed um, is that they've met a pain in the market. So, you know, it's kind of those, that that one aspect. I always get a little frustrated when investors say, oh, it's just the team, or, oh, it's just the technology. Well, I think that that is, to me, that's just one of the three legs of the stool. Um, It has to be team technology and market. And I think sometimes it's easier to assess a team and figure out whether or not they're good people, you know, and they have the right skill sets and things like that. It's much harder to spend the time and diligence looking at all those aspects. And the market is the most nebulous of all those. Um, But it is the most important from my standpoint. But um, ultimately, all three have to make the three-legged stool. Otherwise, you can't sit down on it. So it's just a fundamental um, kind of caricature of the vital aspects of what you need for a successful company. Going back to biotech, um, that market is probably pretty hard to get, you know, kind of your your hands around it, just because it's going to be something that comes out of the market seven years from now. Let's dive into a little bit of that, because I mean, I'm I'm a, a biotech geek as well, so. What would be some of your, um, you know, suggestions to kind of figure that out as an investor? We all know medical technology and medical devices take time to get to market. Um, And it may be that the market pain is there for a while um, before somebody solves it. You know, there are market pains out there that have been around for decades and no one has come up with a solution. Everybody's just kind of cobbled together their own personal solution in doing that. And so I think that that's part of it is you just have to be understanding of the time period. We've got um, two companies right now that are medical devices that are um, we invested in, in in the first fund, so a couple of years ago, and then we reinvested in a follow-on fund and did that. And I would say that one of them is probably going to exit early part of 2019, and the other one will probably exit um, early part of 2020. So less than five to seven years. And that's one of the good things about medical devices, that if they can progress, a lot of them are acquired right after FDA clearance Mm -hmm. um, or some early into market entry. Some have to prove out the market before they're acquired. Just depends on where the market interest is in one of them. them. Uh, One of our companies, I think they'll be purchased, the one that I think will be early 2019, they're just starting into the market right now. They've got their FDA clearance. Um, and I think that the market is showing a real keen interest in it. 
So I think that they're starting to set up and they're already talking to the three or four big players that um, would be their acquirers and have been for a long time. Uh, The other company has not filed for FDA clearance yet, but is within the next nine months is going to file. And I think that one will go fairly quickly. So I think you have to be kind of cognizant of Mm -hmm. the time frame for these companies. What do they have to accomplish and achieve? What kind of FDA filing is it that they're going to have to do? Um, what is the, the value of it? Um, what is the pain that they're solving in the market? Um, how urgent is that? How marketable is that? So there's a lot of different things you have to put into making decisions on investing in the med tech area. It's, it's, it ha- does have another layer of complexities with the regulations and things like that. Um, but um, you can certainly work through all that. There's no question about it. Wonderful. Um, and um, what are the other things that you went? I, I mean, I love all your their, your education that you do, um, especially um, that you're coming down to San Diego. So we're really excited to have you coming down. I'm um, excited too. <laughs> uh, I know. Um, love the the idea of having these workshops that um, angel investment groups can actually capture, um, bring to their city and really um, get their angel group excited about investing and also get that education that they need to kind of understand it. I always need a more education, but again, walk me through a little bit about what you guys do for that workshop, just so that we kind of have a better idea of what you what what that looks like. So the workshop starts out with a basic understanding, um, background on the uh, various aspects of angel investing, what it means to have a diversified portfolio, um, how do you arrive at that, um, and then also discussions about what does an ideal investment look like. Um, they don't exist out there. Everything has a little bit of has risk. That's that's part of the process. And how do you do the risk assessment and evaluation of the company? Um, we also talk about term sheets and, and how to do due diligence and valuation process, um, post-investment engagement with the company. So there's a lot of different topics that we cover in trying to give a very thorough um, background and uh, information and analysis for the members starting out. It's a bit of a fire hose. Um, but the materials that are um, that they cut, walk away with, the notebook the, or the workbook, um, helps them. It's a resource that they can utilize uh, when they're when they're actively investing. They can go back and okay, let me look and see. You know, we try to give tools on questions to ask. Um, how do you do the analysis? Um, what materials would you should you ask for? Documents you should you ask for from the company? Lots of different things that we can, you do along the way. And it's really, it's diving in there and getting your feet wet um, is, is the biggest part of angel investing, frankly. And I think one thing that I didn't realize until I got all the material and all that is that it's also good for advocates of the startup ecosystem as well as entrepreneurs to go through this training. That would be good. Angels um, are, I mean, it's geared to angels, but it is also good. Um, I know historically when I've been teaching in a lot of different places, We've had quite a few entrepreneurs in the room, along with the angel investors, because they're trying to better understand what is it the angels are looking for. Uh, So, yeah, it is actually good for the entrepreneurs to do this as well. Yeah, because we have um, also in in San Diego, I I assume all of the ecosystems across the United States, these advocates that are maybe not entrepreneurs, maybe they are running uh, a group that does events or that they're part of a university. How do you help even university startups to um, get going and, um, and, and get investment? It just depends on if they become, you know, get on my radar mm-hmm. um, and doing that. I've done a lot of training at universities, a lot of training that we do for uh, groups that are sponsored out of universities. Uh, so that, that's pretty common to have that because we're looking at how we, how they can help, how we can help them take those companies, um, you know, a post-grad or something like that and spin that really interesting technology out of the university. So it's awareness um, and it's identification, self-identification and making training like this um, available to them. Uh, so that's really a, a big part of it. Um, Wonderful. In the process. Well, I can't have, I can't wait to have you down here <laughs> in San Diego and, and learning so much from you. Um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, this has just been um, great to learn more about you and oh, what thanks. you, you think is important. The three legged stool is wonderful. <laughs> I love that. Um, um, yeah. anything else that you mean? I mean, you have such a, a 
variety of investments. You've been doing it for such a long time. Any other thing that really at a high level you're saying, hey, this is exact, This is what I've learned as something that is it, it, bringing it all together? Experiential learning is the best. So getting in there and learning and, and working with um, others who are experienced angel investors and, and learning the tricks of the trade, so to speak, from them at doing that. You've got to eventually get your. You get got to eventually get in the game and do that. Um, it is one thing that I find that women are a little bit more timid about is actually making that plunge. But I think that if they join a group and be part of the group and listen to all the really smart um, individuals around them, you learn a tremendous amount. Um, my monthly meetings with my members everybody walks away thinking, my God, that was the most stimulating, interesting conversation because they heard so many really um, informed, intelligent intelligent uh, comments from people who have background that they don't, that they can apply in and, and for analyzing the companies. I think doing that and being around people that are experienced that way is some of the best things you can do and make the investment and do that. Participate on the diligence team. Those are all really important aspects of, of growing as an angel investor. Now that you bring up that um, women are timid about making that investment, mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned that um, joining a group is so important for them to do that. Any other thing that you can say, hey, you know what, I've seen over the years that this really is what kind of turns a female angel investor um, that has never written a check to writing her first check? I think it's just experience. Um, I think mm -hmm. it's exposure. Women want to be trained and understand how to do things before they actually do it. So I think training is really the most important thing for a woman. And it's just just understanding to believe in themselves that they can. They have just as much capability of selecting a good investment as, as the guys do. Um, and with all the training they probably have, they probably have a better capability um, of doing that. So believing in yourself, I think, is the biggest piece for women. And I love that how that ties back to really at where you started off from saying, you know, there wasn't enough female angel investors around the table. And you're like, look, I'm going to create a group and we're going to get going. Mm -hmm. I love That's that. exactly right. I love that because some people exactly. would have seen that and say, OK, I need to invest in more entrepreneurs so that we have more female entrepreneurs on the on the docket. So I, I just love how you just went right into that uh, <laughs> training and getting that group together. Yeah, absolutely. You just have to do it. I love that. I love that. So in the final um, minutes that we have together, I have a rapid final four questions. They're not okay. anything uh, <laughs> um, hard. So, okay. um, uh, of course, we've talked a lot about education on, on this mm -hmm. um, podcast, but what is your favorite angel investing resource out there? Um, anywhere that I can find good deals. <laughs> Um, business, uh, business, uh, competitions, uh, resources, referrals, um, people coming to us, our own members driving everywhere and anywhere, um, that I can find a deal that that's, you gotta, you've gotta look everywhere. And, um, looking everywhere, what about syndication? Oh, syndication is great. Um, I think that we don't do enough of it, and I think we need to do more of it. Um, I think syndication is really great, and because very seldom does a one angel group have the firepower um, to to carry a company for its entire round. And I think it's actually behooves a company to get a diversity of investors. I love that. Um, uh, one more question about syndication because I'm I'm always like so excited about this. Um. There are some syndication networks that are regionally based and some of them that are more like um, online or across like a platform like Proceeder or something like that. What have you found that has been that turnaround of saying this syndication partnership really um, works? I don't ever take into account um, what somebody else has done. We do all of our diligence de novo. So I don't really put a weight on one source over the other. Um, I see it as just a tool by which to um, get good deal flow that we make a d decision on. So it, it's really all over the map. Um, I, I can't really say that there's been one source of deal flow that has been better than another. Thank it's you. It's just, you got to work hard on it. Yeah. <laughs> and do hours of due diligence. Yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So the second question is, um, what's your favorite book? 
it's usually the book I just read. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I'm reading a book called Ghost Wars right now, which is interesting about the pre um, 9-11 um, development of relations and tensions and history um, in Afghanistan, um, in the Middle East, and, and so forth. Um, before that, I read a book called Hillbilly Elegy, which was a fascinating read. I really enjoyed that. Those are, I mean, I, I have a tendency not to read books that are about business um, because I'd like to just relax. So that's that's usually what I do as I read something well outside of where I'm where I'm focusing. Fascinating. Yes, I need a book to actually put me to sleep. So I yeah um, yeah just to kind of unwind and um and have a book that kind of gets you out of the regular. Love that. Love that. Um, the third uh, question is who has been a major influence in your life? You know, I get this question occasionally, and. I never have anybody that I can think of who has been a major influence. Um, I don't feel like I have ever had a mentor in my life. I've always, you know, kind of looked for the pathway that I thought was most interesting and the opportunities there. And doing that, I'm sure there have been people who have influenced me or helped me. I know there have been people who have helped me and, and believed in me along the way. I've never been able to come up with one person in particular that was this big influence on my on my life for doing that. Maybe, you know, your parents are always um my mother was very independent and had her, you know, she was sort of the leader of her pack um kind of thing. And, you know, maybe that is somebody who influenced me from the very beginning because I was always very driven um to accomplish even since I was a little teeny kid and they bought me my first horse when I was seven. It wasn't a pony. It was a full-size horse. And I was ter- determined to ride it. So I just got out there and started did- doing it. I just, um, you know, so that was maybe that, um, maybe that allowing me to have those opportunities to prove myself and build my character is, was really important. I think there's a theme here. Come <laughs> just do it. If you find something, just do it. Okay, I have a big horse. Yes. Get on it. Let's go for yeah. it. Um, yeah. Found a, a need in the marketplace. Let's go for it. Love That's that exactly about right. you. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Fascinating. Um, so the last one is, what does abundance mindset mean to you? Um, so mindset is a way of thinking. Abundance to me means that you are thinking as a glass half full, that you are... Um, Abundance would imply to me that you're optimistic, um, you're big thinking, um, you you are embracing change. You have a very positive attitude toward life. I would consider myself having an abundance mindset. I think there are riches of life out there that are just for your your taking. Uh, if you apply yourself, I've always been an op- opportunistic risk taker, and that's really how it's guided my pathway through life. Um, I think you have to create your own pathway. Um, no one's, you know, maybe sometimes people will do it for you, but I've always felt like if I wanted to do something, I had to pull myself up and I had to do it myself. Um, that I wasn't, I couldn't expect somebody else to do it for me. And that was okay. I'd much rather be in charge of my own fate. I absolutely love that. Opportunistic risk taker. I think I'm going to take that. No, no. <laughs> That's fascinating. I, I love that. I love that. Um, definitely um, uh, dictates your whole career. So thank you so, so much for being part of the podcast. It has just been an honor to, to learn so much more about you. Thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun, Sylvia. And um, I truly am looking forward to being down there in a couple of weeks with all of you and, and having lots and lots of fun together. Thank you. What a fantastic conversation we had with Susan Preston on the podcast. Due diligence is key in the selection process of companies to invest in, as demonstrated in her funds that on average do 150 hours collectively with six to seven people on the due diligence team. Susan also believes that post-investment engagement is equally as important as a check. Of most importance to her is two things. One is tapping into her personal prior experience for the portfolio companies, and number two, reaching out to her network to support their growth. Her advice to start for investment success is really know their one-minute pitch. 
That's extremely important to be able to capture the prospective investor's attention. And she believes that there are three pillars of startup success. One is the team, two, technology, and three, of course, the market. Finally, I loved learning that Susan is an opportunistic risk taker with a deep knowledge of angel trends in education, as well as a deep love for her startup community and growing the number of angel investors. It was a pleasure and honor to have Susan Preston on the podcast. Thank you for listening to and subscribing to the She Invest podcast. Go on over to sheinvest.com for the full show notes for this episode, as well as any resources, websites, and opportunities mentioned during the show. Sign up for the sheinvest.com newsletter to learn about events like our annual Hera Venture Summit during the month of September and our She Invests monthly investor circles. Thank you for your time, talent, and treasure.